All right, everybody, welcome back to our study of the book of Genesis. We're going to take chapter 49. And before we jump in, we're going to talk about the 12 tribes and the prophecy that's over them in this chapter. And if you pull out a Strong's Concordance and you translate the names of these 12 sons, Reuben will mean behold a son, Simeon means heard, Levi will mean joined to, Judah will mean praise, Dan will translate into judge, Naphtali will translate into wrestling or struggles, Gad to troop or fortune, Asher means happy, Issachar means recompense, Zebulun means exalted, Joseph means Yahweh has added, and Benjamin means son of the right hand. All right now pay attention to this because at the end of this I'm going to show you how this comes all together. Right? It's very similar to our Genesis chapter 5 study, how the names had a translation and it gave a message. And in Genesis chapter 5, you remember from Adam to Noah, it would read, Man appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching his death shall bring the despairing comfort rest. Right? A summary of the gospel hidden in Genesis chapter 5. And so keep this in the back of your mind as we move forward. I have a ton of notes for this chapter, and so bear with me. Some of it may be redundant, but that's okay. So chapter 49, we're going to see the blessing of the sons of Jacob and these prophetic blessings upon the sons of Israel. All right, we'll jump into the first two verses. What will befall the sons of Jacob in the last days? Verse 1, And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together, that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together in here, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. So these are patriarchal blessings. The words of a dying father to his sons were considered to be an irrevocable testament and acceptable as decisive evidence in court cases. Beyond any legal recognition, these patriarchal blessings also had the supernatural aspect of the spirit of prophecy, whereby these men of God spoke what was divinely revealed to them. All right. And you'll note Genesis chapter 27 and Genesis 49, and later Moses will do likewise in Deuteronomy chapter 33. And so this was Jacob's last significant act as a patriarch and as the heir to Abraham and Isaac. Here, he prophesied blessings upon each son one by one. And some of what follows are not so much blessings as they are prophecies regarding what God will do with these tribes in the future. And this is the first conscious prophecy spoken by a man in the Bible. There were many prophecies announced by God, such as the promise of the triumph of the seed of the woman in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, uh, and other veiled prophecies by men. But this is the first declared prophecy through a man in the Bible. All right. And so at the very beginning of the blessing, Jacob's going to realize that he was both Jacob and Israel, and his sons are sons of each. This was a place of spiritual maturity, realizing both what God made him, Israel, and what he had to battle against, Jacob. Verses 3 and 4, talking about Reuben. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the, excell the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it, he went up to my couch. So Jacob heaped up praise upon Reuben, his firstborn, but this collapsed when he announced that Reuben had defiled his father's couch, clearly which was a reference to Reuben's adultery with Jacob's concubine Billa in chapter 35, verse 22. Reuben was entitled to leadership and a double inheritance. But because he had the ungoverned impulse of boiling water, turbulent as the waters, he would fail in leadership. In the time of the judges, in chapter 5, in Judges chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, the tribe of Reuben was characterized by irresolution. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 6, will say, Let Reuben live and not die, and let not his men be few. So Reuben is the firstborn of Jacob by Leah from chapter 29. His name is connected with the phrase, The Lord has looked upon my affliction. He is noted for his incestuous act with Billa, his father's concubine. And it was Reuben who advised his brothers not to kill Joseph and return to the pit to release him in chapter 37. Reuben's forfeited birthright was given to Joseph. And the tribe of Reuben was involved in the rebellion in the wilderness in Numbers chapter 16. 
And so we have this bypass of the firstborn. And God often asserts his sovereignty by bypassing the firstborn. And examples are Seth and Cain, Shem over Japheth, Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, Judah, Joseph over Reuben, Moses over Aaron, David, and all of his brothers. And Reuben forfeited his natural rights. His place as the favored firstborn was given to Joseph. His privileges as priest of the family were passed to the sons of Levi. And his right to be the head of the tribes of Israel, or his kingly right, was going to go to Judah. So in the statement, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, have preeminence. Reuben's tribe, as not aiming to excel, unfortunately chose a settlement on the east side of the Jordan. This was a desirable land at the time, but ends up as a buffer between the enemies of Israel later on. The prophecy of Moses, let, his, let not his men be few, in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 6, renders the first numbering of Reuben's tribe as 46,500, and the second numbering as 43,730, in Numbers 26. So there was a decrease when most of the other tribes increased in number. No judge, prophet, nor prince is going to be found of this tribe. And so, as this firstborn of the family, Reuben had claim to the inheritant rights of the firstborn, but he forfeited that through pride, the excellency of dignity, and through immorality. Reuben's immorality with his father's concubine Billa, the mother of his brothers Dan and Naphtali, is going to be recorded in Genesis chapter 35, verse 22, where it says, And it came to pass, when Israel dwelt in that land, that Reuben went and lay with Billa, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. And so because of Reuben's instability, the birthright was divided. Usually this firstborn was the spiritual and the social leader of the clan. But among the sons of Israel, the rights of blessing, priesthood, and ruling authority were divided among brothers rather than being centralized in one. And though we see great wisdom of God in decentralizing authority among the sons of Israel, Reuben paid a high price for his instability. As much as anything, God looks for stable character in those who will lead his people. And the tribe of Reuben never did excel. No prophet, no, no judge, or a king that we know of came from the tribe of Reuben. Reuben is an example of how the first can be last. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 30 will read, But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Right. So a man may have great opportunities and yet lose them. Uncontrolled passions may make him very little who otherwise might have been great. Verses 5 through 7, Simeon and Levi. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath. For it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And so the second born son Simeon and the third born son Levi received the same words for the same evil deed. They were instruments of cruelty when they wiped out all the men of Shechem in retaliation for the rape of their sister Dina in chapter 34, verse 25 through 29. And let's look at that, where it says, And it came to pass on the third day, right after they were circumcised, these men of Shechem, when they were sore, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly, and they slew all the males. And so Jacob, perhaps in weakness, did nothing at the time except register a small self-centered complaint in chapter 34, verse 30, where he says, And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I, being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. Yet he and the Lord remembered this event. This is going to illustrate the principle that the sins of our past can come back to haunt us. Even when we are forgiven, they may carry consequences that we must face for a lifetime. And so the real problem with Simeon and Levi was their anger. In their anger, they slew a man. Their anger was sin because it was rooted in self-will. Right? They humstrung an ox. 
the Bible is going to speak of a godly anger, right? Be angry and do not sin, in Ephesians 4.26. It'll also speak of an ungodly anger, where it says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger be put away from you, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Often, the difference between a godly righteous anger and an ungodly anger is simply self-will. And the prophecy of dividing and scattering turned out to be a curse for Simeon. The tribe of Simeon was the weakest numerically of the twelve. In Numbers 26, verse 14, it'll say, These are the families of the Simeonites, twenty and two thousand and two hundred. And they shared an allotment of land with Judah. Joshua chapter 19, verse 1 will say, And the second lot came forth to Simeon, even for the tribe of the children of Simeon according to their families, and their inheritance was within the inheritance of the children of Judah. All right? Pretty black and white. And so the tribe of Simeon became small during the wilderness wanderings. They started out from Egypt being the third largest tribe. Numbers 1 verse 23 will say those that were numbered of them, even the tribe of Simeon, were 50 and 9,300. But some 35 years later, at the second wilderness census of Israel, 63% of the tribe perished and they became the smallest tribe in Numbers 26 verse 14. And so the prophecy of dividing and scattering became a blessing for Levi because of the faithfulness of this tribe during the rebellion of the golden calf incident. In Exodus 32, verse 26 through 28, we'll read, Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side. And go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. And so it was scattered as a blessing throughout the whole nation of Israel. They received no large tract of land, for the Lord was their inheritance, not land. All right, in Joshua chapter 13, verse 33, will state... But unto the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not any inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance, as he said unto them. So, both Simeon and Levi were scattered, but one was as a blessing and the other was a, a, a curse. All right. And so Levi's name is linked with the root to join. He avenged the seduction of Dina in chapter 34 and 49. And his zeal against idolatry was a cause of the tribe's priestly appointment, as we find in Exodus chapter 32 and Deuteronomy chapter 33 and Malachi chapter 2. Because of the priesthood, this tribe was exempt from the enrollment for military duty in Numbers chapter 1 and 1 Chronicles 12. And they were, not, and, uh, they were subordinate to the sons of Aaron in Numbers 3, 8, and 18. And they were teachers of the law, and they were judges, and they, were, and they guarded the king's person and house in times of danger. Simeon is the second son of Jacob by Leah in Genesis chapter 29. And he's associated with Levi in the terrible act of vengeance against Hamor and the Shechemites in chapter 34. He was detained by Joseph in Egypt as a hostage. His father, when dying, pronounced a malediction against him to be divided and scattered in chapter 49. And they decreased in the wilderness by two-thirds, as we covered. They dwindled in number, and they sank into insignificance. Moses pronounces no blessing on this tribe. They didn't lose their identity, for example. Thirteen Simeonite princes in the days of Hezekiah in 1 Chronicles chapter 4. Verses 8 through 12, Judah. Now, this one's really important. Pay attention. All right, verse 8. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth are whiter than milk. All right. So the term scepter is going to refer to their tribal identity 
and the right to apply and enforce Mosaic laws and educate capital offenses. Right? Just gladly. And it's significant that even during their 70-year Babylonian captivity from 606 to 537 BC, the tribes retained their tribal identity. They retained their own logistics and judges. In Ezra chapter 1, the term Shiloh was understood by the early rabbis and the Talmudic authorities as referring to the Messiah. All right, now pay attention to that. Keep that in mind. And so that Hebrew word Shiloh should be rendered to whom it belongs or whose it is. But it was recognized by these early rabbis and Talmudic scholars as referring to the Messiah. The verse is going to translate to mean the scepter will not depart from Judah until he comes to whom it belongs. So in, eight, in 67 AD, King Herod's son and successor, Herod Archelaus, was dethroned and banished to Vienna, which was a city in Gaul. Archelaus was the second son of Herod the Great. The older son, Herod Antipater, had been murdered by Herod the Great, along with other family members. It was quipped at the time that it was safer to be a dog in that household than a member of the family. So after the death of Herod, which was approximately 4 BC, Archelaus had been placed over Judea as Intharch by Caesar Augustus. Broadly rejected, he was removed in 67 AD. He was replaced by a Roman procurator named Caponius. The legal power of the Sanhedrin was immediately restricted and the education of capital punishment cases was lost. This was normal Roman policy at the time. And so, this is their right to capital punishment. That's the whole reason why they had to bring Jesus before the Roman authorities. So, the scepter had been removed from Judah, but Shiloh had come. While the Jews were weeping in the streets of Jerusalem, thinking the word of God had been broken, a young son of a carpenter was growing up in Nazareth. He would present himself as the Meshiach Nagid, the Messiah the King. On the very day which had been predicted by the angel Gabriel to Daniel five centuries earlier in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Down to the day. From the decree to rebuild the walls... And then you have the uh, 69 weeks of years, 483 years, down all the way to 33 AD, the triumphal entry. This is why Jesus says, had you recognized the day of my coming? And Jesus wept. Jesus was holding them accountable to understand prophecy. God doesn't deal with approximates. He told them exactly the day that he would present himself. Fascinating. And so, Judah wasn't a completely exemplary character. He suggested a profit motive in getting rid of Joseph in chapter 37, verse 26. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? And he did not deal faithfully with his daughter-in-law Tamar either in chapter 38, verse 26, where it says, And Judah acknowledged them and said, She has been more righteous than I, because I gave her not to Shelah my son, and he knew her again no more. And he had sex with her as a prostitute in chapter 38, verse 18. And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet, thy bracelets, and thy staff that is in thy hand. And he gave it to her, and he came in unto her, and she conceived by him. But he showed good character when he interceded and offered himself as a substitute for Benjamin in chapter 44. Overall, this blessing is an example of the richness of God's grace to the undeserving. So in a powerful way, this prophecy over Judah is a description of Judah's greatest descendant, Jesus Christ. And so, you are he whom your brother shall praise as a lion, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, all of this. Each of these is going to refer to the ruling position Judah will have among his brethren. He inherited the leadership aspect of the firstborn's inheritance. This leadership position among his brothers meant that the eventual kings of Israel would come from Judah and that the Messiah, God's ultimate leader, would eventually come from the tribe of Judah. And he did. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, Jesus is called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And so the firstborn normally had two rights. First, he was the leader of the family, the new patriarch. Second, he was entitled to a double share of the inheritance receiving twice as much as any of the other brothers. And so, 
This leadership prophecy took some 640 years to fulfill in part with the reign of David, first of Judah's dynasty of kings. The prophecy took some 1,600 years to completely fulfill itself in Jesus Christ. Jesus is referred to as Shiloh, the name meaning he whose right it is or to whom it belongs, and the title anciently understood to speak of the Messiah, as we've covered. So from David until the Herods, a prince of Judah was head over Israel, even Daniel in captivity. The promise was that Israel would keep this scepter, this right to capital punishment, until Shiloh comes. Even under their foreign masters during this period, Israel had a limited right to self-rule until about 7 AD. And at that time, under Herod and the Romans, their right to capital punishment, a small but a remaining element of their self-governance, was taken away. All right, And so at that time, the rabbis considered it a disaster of unfulfilled scripture. Seemingly, the last vestige of the scepter had passed from Judah, from their point of view, but they didn't see the Messiah. And so reportedly, the rabbis walked the streets of Jerusalem and said, Woe unto us, for the scepter had been taken away from Judah, and Shiloh has not come. Yet there's a little boy working in the carpenter shop in Nazareth. Right? God's word had not been broken. <laughs> I love that. And so certainly Jesus was alive then. Perhaps this was the very year that he was about 12 years old and discussed God's word in the temple with the scholars of his day. Perhaps he impressed them with his understanding of this very issue. And so this blessing also contained a description of Judah's material abundance, the vine, the choice vine. Judah's land was great wine-growing country. And so Judah's name will mean praised, with the root meaning to praise. He intercedes for Joseph's life when his brethren were about to slay him and proposes a uh, sale to the Ishmaelites. Later, he had committed incest with Tamar, his daughter-in-law. His tribe was loyal to the house of David at the time of the revolt of the ten tribes in 1 Kings 12, and he led the first division of Israel in their journeys in Numbers 10. This tribe was commissioned of God to lead in the conquest of the promised land in Judges chapter 1, and, he made, and they made David king in 2 Samuel chapter 2. Verse 13, he's talking about Zebulun. Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall adjoin Sidon. So Jacob now skipped the birth order, moving from the tenth born and ninth born sons, but keeping his focus on the sons born of Leah. The tribe of Zebulun was noted for its faithfulness to David, supplying the largest number of soldiers to David's army of any single tribe. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 33 will state, Of Zebulun there were 50,000 who went out to battle, expert in war with all weapons of war, stout-hearted men who could keep ranks. So the tribe of Zebulun seems to have settled the piece of land sitting between the Mediterranean Sea and the Sea of Galilee. Literally, shall dwell by the haven of the sea can be translated looking towards the sea. Zebulun did look to the sea, both to the east and west. So Zebulun would be enriched by seaborne trade between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean, though it did not actually border the Mediterranean, from Josh's, uh, Josh chapter 19. And uh, in the area of Galilee, to the north of Issachar and south of Asher and Naphtali, it was between the Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean. And it was to enjoy a large share of our Lord's public ministry, as we find in Isaiah chapter 9 and Matthew chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Issachar. So Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. So Issachar was a large tribe. It was third in size according to the Numbers chapter 26 census. Because of their size and abundance, they were often targets of oppressive, uh, oppressive foreign armies who put them in servitude. Thus they became a band of slaves. And so the meaning seems to be that Issachar was strong, but they were docile and lazy. He would enjoy the good land assigned him, but he would not strive for it. Therefore, eventually, he would be pressed into servitude and the mere bearing of burdens for his masters. And so the word homar garim in Hebrew literally means bony ass and designates a powerful beast of burden that submits himself to the galling yoke without complaint in order, in order that he may be free to lie quietly in ease and comfort. 
So Issachar is located in the fertile, broad, pleasant plain of uh, Estrelon. It was often subject to the invading armies. Jacob was predicting that the tribe of Issachar would submit to the Canaanite invaders who would fasten the yoke upon them. And instead of fighting, the men of this tribe would submissively allow themselves to become slaves of the people of the land. They would prefer the shame of slavery to courageous action. Issachar was Jacob's ninth son by Leah, and the word Sakari means my hire. And the prophetic blessing pronounced by Jacob corresponds with that of Moses, that they were a large tribe, and only the tribe of Judah and Dan were stronger. Uh, Issachar had 64,300 in Numbers 26, and they grew to 87,000 by the time of 1 Chronicles chapter 7. Issachar received the richest portion of the Jezreel Valley in 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Verse 16 through 18, Dan. Dan shall judge his people and one of the tribes of Israel, or as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels, so that it, its rider shall fall backward. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. So the tribe of Dan did judge his people. They supplied one of the most prominent of the judges, Samson. In Judges chapter 13, verse 2, will say, There was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And, of course, Samson eventually came forth. Dan was a troublesome tribe. They were the ones that introduced idolatry into Israel. In Judges chapter 18, verse 30, will read, And the children of Dan set up the graven image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan, until the day of the captivity of the land. Jeroboam set up one of his idolatrous golden calves in Dan in 1 Kings 12. In verse 28 it will read, Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Right? Talking about these golden calves. And later, Dan became a center of idol worship in Israel. In Amos chapter 8, verse 14, They that swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manner of Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. So some were going to think that the serpent, by the way, refers to the idea that the Antichrist would come from the tribe of Dan based on Daniel chapter 11, verse 37, where it says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the, the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. And Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 16. The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of neighing of his strong ones, for they are come, and have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. So Dan is going to be left out of the listing of the tribes regarding the 144,000 that are sealed in Revelation chapter 7, verses 5 through 8. But Dan is the first tribe listed in Ezekiel's millennial roll call of the tribes in Ezekiel chapter 48. And so what is it saying is that this is a remarkable sign of God's redemption. Even though they're left out in chapter 7, they're obviously meet redemption and they're in that millennial reign. And so the Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua. And at this point in the prophecy, when Jacob was near death, he called out for God's salvation. So knowingly or not, Jacob called out for Jesus, right? Yeshua. <laughs> I love that. And so Dan shows another disparity between calling and achievement. Dan was to provide justice, right? Dan means judge. But the tribe chose treachery instead, like a snake by the roadside. The Hebrew word uh, Nahosh signifies not only a snake in the grass, but a venomous reptile with deadly fangs. In the time of the judges, the first major practice of idolatry appeared in the tribe of Dan. In 931 BC, right, Jeroboam set up that golden calf in Dan to provide opportunity for pagan worship, as we covered. Some of these notes are redundant. That's okay. We get it through repetition. And so the omission of Dan in Revelation chapter 7 is commonly attributed to that. The tribe of Dan was the first to fall into idolatry. They are also slighted in the list of genealogies with the names of his sons omitted in Genesis chapter 46 and Numbers 26. Or the names are blotted out in 1 Chronicles uh, 1 through 10 and Revelation chapter 7. 
When the tribe of Dan is mentioned in the text, they are usually listed last. In Numbers 10 um, and other passages there. All right. Verse 19, Gad. Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. All right. So the tribe of Gad supplied many fine troops for the later king of Israel, David, in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 14. Right? These were the sons of Gad, captains of the host. One of the least was over a hundred, and the greatest over a thousand. And so in the days of Jeremiah, among other times, foreign armies oppressed Gad. In Jeremiah 49, verse 1, Concerning the Ammonites, Thus saith the Lord, Hath Israel no sons? Hath he no heir? Why then does their king inherit Gad, and his people dwell in the cities? Yet victory would be his end, uh, would would be his in the end, right? He shall triumph at last. So this has been a blessing of many a child of God to fight and apparently to lose the battle, yet to win it at the end. And so Gad, three of the six Hebrew words in verse 19 are a play on the name Gad, which means attack. Gad will be attacked by a raid of attackers, but he will attack. The verb gadad means to break into or to attack. Border raids were often experienced by the tribes Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh that settled east of the Jordan River in 1 Chronicles 5. Gad was Jacob's seventh son by Zilpah, Leah's handmaid. He was the full brother of Asher in Genesis 30 and chapter 46 as well, whose name means fortune or luck. The tribe of Gad was fierce, and they were warlike. They were strong men of might, men of war for the battle, that could handle shield and buckler, their faces, the faces of lions, and like rose upon the mountains of swiftness. Elijah was of the tribe of Gad, if you'll remember from 1 Kings 17, verse 1. Verse 20, Asher. Bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. So in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 24, Moses again took up this prophecy regarding Asher. Asher is most blessed of sons. Let him be favored by his brothers and let him dip his foot in oil. Apparently, the land eventually occupied by Asher was good enough to bring not only necessities, but also luxuries. And so this tribe of Asher was going to be fertile and productive, providing rich food. The tribe settled along the rich northern coast of Canaan from Mount Lebanon to the Mediterranean in Joshua chapter 19. Royal dainties described workmen and materials that were provided to David in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and to Solomon in 1 Kings 5. This tribe kept Passover under Hezekiah in contrast to the others in 2 Chronicles 30, which demonstrated faithfulness to the Mosaic priesthood. Also, the tribe of Asher belonged to the prophetess Anna, if you'll remember from Luke chapter 2, verse 36. Verse 21, Naphtali. Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. So Naphtali's land was a key portion near the Sea of Galilee, the region where Jesus did much of his teaching and ministry. Now when Jesus heard, right, this is Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 through 16. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put into prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. And so he uses beautiful words. Because so much of the ministry of Jesus took place in the region of Naphtali, this was fittingly said of him. And so Naphtali was the fifth son of Jacob, the second born to him by Rachel's handmaid, Billa. He was the, four, the full brother of Dan in chapter 30. At his birth, Rachel is said to have ex, uh, exclaimed, Wrestlings of God, mighty wrestlings, with whom have I wrestled? So Naphtali, much like a doe, would be a free mountain people. Deborah sang of the people of Naphtali risking their lives on the heights of the field in Judges chapter 5, verse 18. The tribe settled north and northwest of the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, Bethsaida, and Chorazin. Verse 22 through 26, Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow by a well. 
His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him and hated him, but his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong. By the hands of the mighty God of Jacob, from there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By the God of your father who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb, and the blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors. Up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph, and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. And so the phrase, fruitful bow by a well, is a concept of riches. Jacob took up the promise of fruitfulness from the name of Joseph's son Ephraim, which means fruitful, and lavished the promise of victory and prosperity on Joseph's two tribes. Victory in battle was experienced by Joshua, Deborah, and Samuel, all of the tribe of Ephraim, and by Gideon and uh, Jephthah, both of Manasseh's tribe. So Jacob bestowed on Joseph the greater blessings because he was the prince among his brothers. His name means, may he, God, add sons. And he was the firstborn of Rachel, J Jacob's loved wife. So he was favored, despised, sold, and then he was exalted. If you remember from Genesis chapter 37 all the way to chapter 50. There are over 100 ways Joseph is a type or a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Ephraim was the second son of Joseph. He was adopted by Jacob and blessed before Manasseh. Ephraim became the leading tribe of the northern kingdom and called himself the house of Israel. Later, sometimes Ephraim was used as a synecdote for the northern kingdom. And so Manasseh's name means making to forget. He was the first son of Joseph and Asenath in chapter 41 and 46. And he was also adopted by Jacob. This tribe was renowned for its valor with Gideon in the west in Judges chapter 6 and Jephthah in the east in Judges chapter 11. So their inheritance was split with half the tribe east of the Jordan in Numbers 32 and half of the tribe west of the Jordan in Joshua chapter 16 and 17. And so Joseph is a fruitful bow. This is a, both a description of Joseph's life and a personal blessing concerning his descendants. In a sense, Joseph's tribes were already blessed when his sons received their blessing in chapter 48. So this description of Joseph as fruitful bow by a well speaks of his being well watered and provided for in his deep and real relationship with God. And so the real main point in Joseph's character was that he was in clear and constant fellowship with God, and therefore God blessed him greatly. He lived to God and was God's servant. He lived with God, and he was God's child. And though Joseph was shot at and hated, he was still a fruitful bow. This was because the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. The idea is that God's hands were on Joseph's hands, giving him strength and skill to work the bow expertly. God was there even when Joseph didn't know it. And Joseph was certainly blessed in his posterity. His tribes were some of the most populous. So in this sense, he received the material blessing, the double portion aspect of the inheritance of the firstborn. And so Jacob could say this because, you know, for much of his life, he was a scoundrel, right? The blessings of your father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors. Now at the end of his days, he saw just how good God was to him. He was forgiven much and he loved much. Luke chapter 7 verse 47 will read, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And so in his words about Joseph, Jacob listed five great titles for God. These titles are going to show that Jacob did come to an understanding of who God is. The mighty God of Jacob, the shepherd, the stone of Israel, the God of your father, and the almighty. This is much better than than when Jacob referred to God as the God of Abraham or the fear of his father Isaac in chapter 31. Now he knew who God was for himself. Verse 27, Benjamin. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. And so this was the tribe with a reputation for fierceness. To see the great extent of this, just look at Ehud in Judges chapter 3, verse 15 through 23. You remember Ehud 
uh, he strapped a, a dagger to his inner thigh so that he could slaughter <coughs> one of these, uh, some of the leadership, right? Uh, the bad leadership at the time in, in Judges that was oppressing Israel at the time. In Judges chapter 3, verse 21, I'll just short change it here. It'll say, And Ehud put forth his, his left hand, and he took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And of course, it sank into his belly and he died. He ended up locking the door and escaping out. Uh, Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. In 1 Samuel 9, verse 1, it'll say, Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of, of, of Abel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Ephia, the Benjamite, who was a mighty man of power. And also, 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 47 through 52 where it says, So Saul took the kingdom over Israel and fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the children of Ammon, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, against the Philistines, and whithersoever he turned himself, he vexed them. And he gathered a host, and he smote the Amalekites and delivered Israel out of the hands of them that spoiled them. As well as Paul in the New Testament, you'll remember from Acts chapter 8, Verses 1 through 3. And before he was Paul, remember he was Saul. And Saul was consenting unto his death, talking about the stoning of Stephen. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so the cruelty of the tribe in general is going to be seen in Judges chapter 19 and 20. And so the phrase, he shall dwell between his shoulders, is interesting when you look at the location of Benjamin. It's a very small area, yet it sits in Jerusalem with the boundary of the Tirpion Valley. Mount Zion is used collectively of this area, but technically this area includes the Mount of Olives, the Kidron Valley, Mount Zion, and south is the Hidden Valley. The area of Mount Moriah which was the site of the sacred edifice, lay in the confines of Benjamin. So his portion is between the shoulders. And so Benjamin was the youngest son of Jacob, and he was called the son of the right hand by his father. The old English word revin means to pray with rapacity. It speaks of a fierce cruelty, which describes a tribe violent in spirit, a ravenous and devouring wolf. And uh, you'll note the cruel Benjamites in Judges chapter 20 and Saul a Benjamite as well, as we covered. And notable heroes out of this tribe will include Ehud, who delivered Israel from the Moabites, Saul, the first king, Jonathan, Queen Esther in Esther chapter 2, and the Apostle Paul from Romans chapter 11. And so the tribe of Benjamin earned a high reputation for bravery and skill in war and was noted for its slingers with their traditional left-handed action in Judges chapter 3, verse 15. Verse 28. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them, and he blessed them, and he blessed each one according to his own blessing. All right. So some of the things mentioned regarding these tribes may seem a bit cloudy, but only because we may not know their exact fulfillment until the age to come. And so each son and each tribe that would come from them had their own calling and destiny. Yet the remarkable promise remained that they each would survive and grow into significant tribes without one perishing during the centuries to come in Egypt when they were in captivity. Verse 29 through 32, right? Jacob is going to make his son's promise to bury him in Canaan. Verse 29. Then he charged them and said to them, I am, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heth. So Jacob was confident that his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham continued to live in the eternal state and that he would be gathered to them. Though Jacob was now in Egypt, he knew that he was not an Egyptian. He was the son of the promise, an heir of God's covenant with Abraham. And he asked to be buried in the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by covenant. 
And so Egypt was filled with magnificent tombs. And because of the respect that Jacob had, he could have been buried like a pharaoh. But he wanted to be buried in an obscure cave in Canaan because Canaan was the land of promise. Verse 33. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into his bed and he breathed his last and was gathered to his people. And so this ends the life of the last of the great patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet the work and plan of God did not end. It continued through men and generations to come. And so there are said to be three basic attitude towards death. Among the ancient Greeks, they held to what can be called the death-accepting view. Our modern world is sold out on a death-denying approach. The biblical approach is a death-defying attitude. And so the listing of the 12 tribes. These 12 tribes are listed some 20 times in the scripture. In Genesis, you'll have this um, in chapter 29... Through 35, you have the origin, the natural order of Jacob's 12 sons. Chapter 46, they're listed when they're entering Egypt. Chapter 49, you have Jacob's prophetic blessing. In Exodus, chapter 1, they're entering Egypt. Joseph is admitted. He was already in Egypt. In Numbers, uh, you'll see in chapter 1, the leaders, the first census where Levi is omitted. Chapter 2, the order of the camp, only order given three times, 2, 7, and 10. Um... Chapter 7, the offerings. Chapter 10, the order of March. Chapter 13, the spies were Levi's omitted. Chapter 26, the second census were Levi's omitted. And chapter 34, dividing the land where the eastern tribes were omitted. In Deuteronomy chapter 27, you have the blessings and cursings. Chapter 33, the blessings of Moses where Simeon is omitted. The order is geographical. Benjamin is going to be before Joseph. In Joshua uh, chapter 13, you have the allocation of the territories. In Judges, you have the Song of Deborah, where Judah and Simeon were omitted. Uh, First Chronicles, you have um, the genealogies where Zebulun's omitted, and the officers under David were Gad and Asher omitted in First Chronicles 27. And Ezekiel in chapter 48, the kingdom divisions in the millennium. And in Revelation chapter 7, you have the sealing of the 12,000 from each tribe where Dan is omitted. Now pay attention. I told you to, to remember from the very beginning. Here it comes, all right? So the listing of the 12 tribes in Revelation chapter 7. Now, in the order that it is written, let's just read it based on the translation of the names from our Strong's Concordance based on biblical usage, right? Praise the Lord. He has looked on my affliction and granted good fortune. Happy am I. My wrestling has made me forget my sorrow. God hears me, has joined me, purchased me and exalted me by adding to me the son of his right hand I love that all in order there and so I'll give you another little sneak peek the camp of Israel in Numbers chapter 2 the scripture is going to detail the camp of Israel and it's going to describe how the tabernacle was always at the center the tribe of Levi encamped around the tabernacle The remaining 12 tribes were grouped into four camps around the Levites. You'll note the baker's dozen, 13 and not 12. So they each had an emblem reflecting the sign that was associated with them. The camp of Dan, which was Naphtali, Asher, and Dan, was symbolized by the eagle, and it was the direction to the north. The camp of Reuben, Gad, Semen, and Reuben, was symbolized by the man and the direction of south. The camp of Ephraim, Benjamin, Manasseh, and Ephraim, was symbolized by the ox and the direction of west. And the camp of Judah, Zebulun, Issachar, and Judah, was symbolized by the lion and the direction of east. And so the four tribal standards will match the four faces of the cherubim which surround the throne of God in both Ezekiel and the book of Revelation. The four Gospels also have a specific design. Matthew presents Jesus as the Messiah with the extensive genealogy of Abraham, or the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Mark is the only Gospel without a genealogy, and it's going to present Jesus as the servant. The symbol of a servant is the ox. Luke was a physician, and he was interested in Jesus' humanity, and so he presents Jesus as the Son of Man, 
and his symbol is a man. And he takes his genealogy from Adam, the first man. John was the mystic, and he presents Jesus as the Son of God, and his symbol is the eagle. So, Numbers chapter 2 is a good reminder that every detail in Scripture is there by deliberate design. So if you find something and you may not understand, there may be something hidden in the details. Remember what Jesus said, The volume of the book is written of me in Psalm 40 verse 7 and Hebrews chapter 10 verse 7. Now pay attention to this. And so when you have these tribes listed by number, right, Judah and their tribes will come out to 186,000. Reuben and their tribes, 151,450. Ephraim and their tribes, 108,100. And Dan with their tribes, 157,600. Now let's look at how the tribe was supposed to be encamped around the tabernacle in Numbers chapter 2. And the Torah, of course, the first five books of the Bible written by, Mo written by Moses at about 1400 B.C. All right, now remember that. This would be an aerial view of how they were to march into the Holy Land around the tabernacle. And what you would see from the air, from God's point of view, is a Roman cross. And it's here, right, in the Torah, written at 1400 B.C. Let me remind you that the Persians in history were the ones who invented crucifixion, as you'll find in the book of Esther, right, where... Um, <clears throat> Haman was hung, or well, really he was pulled down on a pole that was put through his rear and out his neck that he had built for Mordecai. And at the end of that a whole story, he's the one that gets hung on his own. Um, he's the one that gets crucified, essentially. I believe the Persians invented that level of uh, method of crucifixion around 600 or so, 650 B.C., then the Greeks took them after that and made the X, and then the Romans following that made the crucifixion that our Lord and Savior hung upon. So how is it that a Roman cross is encrypted in Numbers chapter 2 and the marching orders for Israel going into the Holy Land? I love that. And so what we will see is that in our hands, this Holy Bible, we have a collection of 66 books penned by over 40 authors written over a span of 1,500 years. And it's an integrated message system. It all agrees with each other. That's our first discovery. The second discovery that we make is that the information in the Bible comes from outside the domain of space and time. There's the only way you can explain it. It's a supernatural quality of the Bible that no other literature on the planet does. Right? How could Moses have anticipated a Roman cross in the Torah? There is no way any Jewish establishment would have snuck this in to Numbers chapter 2. All right, and I love that. And you can find more study material at Taylor Bible Study.